so yeah hi to everybody um, and, and i guess thanks to um, the coaches club academy for inviting me to to come on and to speak um we, we agreed for me to speak about coaching via a constraints based approach which is quite wordy um i'll get into what that might mean in a moment um, and hopefully we can I can add some value and then we can have a good discussion or Q and A type thing at, at the end. Um, I find it always useful just to talk about people's background when somebody is presenting, and I don't intend for this to be look at me and the roles that I've had. Um, far from it, more just to perhaps um, use this by sharing some of my experiences within these organisations to, I guess, help shape my thinking and behind developing this presentation for you all this afternoon um, and it, it might just help join a few things up so within my career obviously I've operated as I've operated primarily as a coach um, in my early career at Portsmouth Football Club and at AFC Bournemouth in the centre of excellences as they were termed then obviously now called academies I then was fortunate enough to get a full-time role within the FA um, working with five to 11 year olds in the FA skills program um, a real interesting time for the FA when we rolled out the FA Youth Development Review. So we made some changes to our young people's experiences of football and we implemented 5v5 and 7 versus 7 and not, sorry, 5v5 and 9v9 for all to complement 7v7 and 11v11 that was already in place. Um, and we rolled out at the time the FA Youth Award coaching qualifications, which were the FA don't run now because they've redeveloped new courses but they were very innovative at the time and it was a really good time to be at the FA with, with Dan Ashworth joining us and making a number of changes to the national teams and to roll out the England DNA as well. So it was really, really good. Um, like what happens in many industries, you spend a lot of time coaching um, to progress your career. You, you end up managing other coaches. So within the FA, I ended up becoming a regional lead for, for coaching for five to 11s. Um, which was a great role to have. The downside of it was it took me off the grass a little bit, um, but I really, really enjoyed leading other people and I got into like leadership and strategy and some other topics that I think correlate really nicely with coaching, um, but ones that I found really interesting. So I ended up doing some of that stuff and that led me to Surrey FA, which is a, a county regional association where I was employed as head of football development so my role there actually was, was no coaching as part of it. I oversaw coach development um, and coach development included FA coaching qualifications from level one to UA for B and other coaching qualifications such as futsal, goalkeeping, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I also oversaw refereeing and referee development and then just more generally grassroots participation broadly in the sport. So women and girls football, male football, walking football, a little bit of everything, but it was a really strategic role one that gave me a real insight into more football business, you could probably term it. Um, but again, I, I didn't get to spend time on the grass. So what I did while I was working at Surrey FA, and I've actually missed them out, I think, on my um, on my slide here, is I, I got a role working part-time at Fulham Football Club within the academy. So I was employed at Surrey FA full-time as head of football development and then worked for Fulham part-time, where I still got to get my hands dirty and go and coach. And they won't forgive me for not putting them on the slide, I don't think. Um, more recently, very recently, I've just taken a role um, as, a, as a lecturer and a, and a programme sort of leading in St Mary's University um, in London, where we deliver football programmes. Um, we deliver a programme with Chelsea Football Club. There's some challenges there with my Fulham role in Chelsea, um, but I'm still, still connected to Fulham and still coaching in the academy, working with Chelsea on a daily basis in, uh, in the degree programme. And then we also deliver master's degrees in in coaching and professional development. So some of the topics that I learned from Surrey FA, such as strategic leadership and all the rest of it start to come up. Um, so I, I, there was a few different topics I considered talking to you about. Um, I was quite interested in perhaps leadership um, within football, but maybe that's one for another day. Um, so we've gone via this, um, gone into this like coaching via a constraints based approach. So hopefully that just gives you some context about me. It's not about me at all. It just hopes, hopefully gives you some um, context about my background and why I'm talking about what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to start quite broad about what learning is. And I suppose as a, a newly employed academic, it would be rude of me to not chuck in some academic references. Um, but there we are. So learning is broad, multidimensional, complex. So it's, it's this, this thing that people seem to pick up in different ways. Um, but it's a, I guess we could probably all agree it's a process by 
we have behavior change or we, or we pick something up, some knowledge or some skills or an attitude at the end of it. And those are, our, I guess, academic definitions. There are loads of academic definitions of learning. And of course, you've got your own. The reason I bring learning up is because it links to constraints and can coaching via a constraints based approach. So, so bear with me. Coaching traditionally and coaches believe we have a lot of knowledge and we want to share it. We also want rapid improvements in our athletes. Um, but we do know that rapid improvement may not actually be that good for long term learning. So we're now considering coaching and learning as two things that run in, in correlation with each other. So I guess that just begs the question, is there a right way to coach? And it's a question for you to consider and a, and a more of a rhetorical question. Another a few other sort of rhetorical questions are do we coach too much? Not enough. How do I know as the coach? And how do I know that my players are learning? Because learners are supposed to learn. Players are supposed to learn. Coaches are supposed to help this process. But I've used the word there sometimes. Sometimes this happens. Sometimes perhaps it doesn't. And again, questions for you to consider in regards to performance versus learning. Are you looking for performance as in a performance for a game on the weekend? And three points, for instance, is very, very crucial. Are you looking for long term player development and long term learning or are you in an environment that's looking for both and therefore what are you looking for within your coaching sessions what are the types of characteristics that your coaching sessions might convey and might have as, as a part of them and these are important considerations when it comes to constraints and particularly a, a games based approach to our teaching which I'll get to have you considered how your learners might learn have you considered how you might coach to enable that and have you considered how you will design your practice to ensure that your players might have the best chance of learning something, whatever that something is, whether it's passing, playing out from the back, finishing from crosses, whatever. So I guess question, and I, and I know we're full of questions at the moment, how do we develop autonomous games players who are good at learning? And we know that football is a game. How do we intervene and support our players? And I guess coach, what behaviours do we exhibit as coaches to enable that to happen? And how do we design practices that look and feel like the game? I'm just going to play you a quick video. Hopefully this comes through all right. So I guess another consideration to have is would your sessions typically look like the escalator or the keyboard that had become where the stairs were on that video? And we know that the game of football is a game. Often our players embark on that as a game because they find it fun. Um, and we now learn and we know that learning happens at messy intervals and at different rates. And it means different things to different people. So one conclusion we can make by having some of these considerations about 
learning about coaching and about the game of football is that good learning could happen in a game. Um, but what makes a game a game? And I'll come back to that in a second. If we consider traditional approaches to coaching at this stage, traditional approaches to coaching might be very drill based, very technique based, and would focus on what we in academia call the motor skills of the athlete, which is basically passing, dribbling, shooting, crossing, whatever you might want to want to frame it or term it as essentially techniques in football. But we know from research about learning and we know from research about the game that what academics again call cognitive skills are as important as the motor skills. Cognitive skills are the brain making decisions for the body um, and the brain having other stimuli such as fun, such as engagement um, and such as the ability to develop social skills whilst in the game of football. So I guess what we then start to drew, draw from that in terms of conclusions is that a games-based approach to our teaching, and again in academia, games-based pedagogy is perhaps a, a good route to go down to try and ensure that some learning can perhaps happen. And I urged you earlier to consider your own environment, whether it's a performance-based environment or, or whether it's about long-term development. And performance environments might require quick fixes that need to happen for Saturday because there's three points at stake and it needs to happen very quickly. Long-term player development environments might be academies, grassroots clubs, younger players typically, where we can afford the time to enable the learning to, to try and stick a bit more and, and can take a, a little longer. So I guess the point I'm making here is that we are, I am advocating a games-based approach or I'm talking to you about a games-based approach to coaching. Um, because it is reinforced by research around how learning might happen and it is more engaging and motivating for the athlete to partake in. So if we do recognise and you're still with me that good learning can happen in a game, but what makes a game a game? Um, there's a definition of six things if we listen to Story and Butler, who are, again, some academic researchers. And I'll talk through this and I'll try and bring this to life because as a, as a football coach, I recognise this is this is academic and it's just wordy where it perhaps doesn't need to be. A game needs to be compromised of codependent agents. What that means is, is if I'm playing as a number nine and I'm playing against the centre back who's wearing a shirt number five, my behaviour on the pitch will be affected by that shirt number five. It might be that shirt number five is absolutely massive and he's seven foot and he just wants to boot me. I therefore might not go up against him for a header because I just don't see the point even though ordinarily I might win a load of headers. That's because I've got that codependent agent. I've got somebody to codepend on. I am in a game. So there's lots of other players in it and I'm making those decisions. Equally, another example of a codependent agent might be I have the ball and my I know that my teammate is really, really quick. So I can pump the ball in behind and he can just run after it or she can run after it. So I have to have those codependent agents. The game has to be self-organizing where athletes can just do it without explicit instructions from the coach. It needs to be open to disturbance, and that's fairly self-explanatory. There needs to be sites of co-emergent learning. What that means is that the game could have intentions of teaching, let's say, crossing and finishing, but equally, there are opportunities for the athletes to, to learn something else. I could be in that session with the number five that I spoke about earlier, and I'm working on my finishing from across, but one thing I've learned in a co-emergent way is that this guy's massive and I want to stay away from him. It could be as simple as that. So there needs to be sites of co-emergent learning. They need to be open to varying interpretations of time. And I guess athletes are able to get into this state of flow. I'm sure you've all been there where you say to the players, it's the end of the session now. And they're like, really? That's gone quickly. Or equally, they might have gone the other way and go, can we play a game yet? You know, you're boring me. I want to get to the, get to the end. Um, and players are able to evolve their structures in response to feedback. So, by an academic sense, that's what makes a game a game. To us as football coaches, a game is a football match with goals, or it could be end zones or target areas. It will have two teams, probably be from like at least 1v1, more likely 2v2, up to 11v11, and it will be a game in the traditional format. And we recognise from the research and, and some of the academic stuff there that that environment is a good place for players to learn some stuff. 
So we understand that we can coach through games and we can get our players into a game. I suppose, hopefully you're with me, like, okay, we can put players in a game, but how can we coach? How can we coach through the games if we, if we don't know already? And I guess this model hopefully illustrates some of that. So on the left-hand side here, you've got a practice type. So you've got the traditional based practices around blocked practice, constant practice or drill based practice, which we would suggest shape behavior. So if I was to put, place you into a session where you're in pairs, and you pass the ball to each other 10 yards apart off the inside of your foot, you get good at passing the ball to your teammate over 10 yards off the inside of your foot. So I've shaped that behavior. If I use constraints in a game, I can actually start to shape behavior in context of the game. And equally, if I use what academics call a game centered approach, I can shape behavior and start to understand the context. There's an additional way where we can use video games to understand and shape behavior across context. I'm going to focus a little bit on constraints and game-centered approaches. Um, and before I do, I'll just touch on video games. Video games is a way of um, linking learning to something that the athletes are interested in. And this would be really important for young players or, or could be effective for young players where you talk about the ability to level up and go up levels within the session. And you give the players specific things such as invisibility cloaks, or you give them um, different types of constraints that enable them to link it to a video game type of way of learning and thinking. If you think about the number of young players that partake in video games, what they like about video games is different levels of, of learning um, and they can find their level within the session. And that essentially is the uh, quick and easy way of describing how video games might come in. I'm going to talk to you a little bit around constraints and, and game centered approaches of being able to coach in a way of coaching through games. So if I begin with constraints, they've been defined as boundaries which shape behavior. So by placing a constraint on a game, it's not a rule, it is a boundary which can shape the behavior of the athlete and we can start to nudge their behavior towards the outcome we want, crossing and finishing, for instance. Um, an interaction with the constraints forces that learner to undertake additional cognitive processes. So remember me earlier talking about motor skills, which is passing, shooting, dribbling, whatever, and in cognitive skills such as adaptation, decision-making, et cetera, interaction with constraints places our learner in the ability to have to do both, which is a good thing. When we talk constraints, there's a model that comes up quite often. I must admit that the it's a bit pixelated. Apologies for that, it's not great. Um, but essentially there are three main constraints you could consider. You could consider constraining the individuals within your sessions, and they might have even different constraints. It's quite an effective way of being able to support a player that's really good at something and then also equally at the same time support a player that's not so good at something by constraining individuals. You can constrain the environment by playing with things like the pitch geography. Um, you could put them in a really small pitch and it would place different constraints on it versus a really big pitch with loads of space in behind. And equally, you can constrain the task that's at hand. Um, so you could make it more points, worth more points if you score from across, for instance. So there's three main ways typically we would consider constraining practices. So task, and I've kind of just explained this, task is constraints of the task and, and the rules that govern that task, environments such as pitch size, and then constraints that reside with individuals within the practice. Here's some examples. So three columns here on the table. On the left hand side, we've got specific tasks that we could attribute to individual players. So we could task a player to be a floater that could play for both teams. We can give each player individual targets that might link to their own, um, their own targets that they have as players. They might want to get better at certain areas of their game. We can give them a challenge related to an upcoming game. We can give them game related actions, i.e. you can you must cross the ball when you receive it or try to cross the ball when you receive it. We could perhaps talk to the player about the number of touches. If you score off one touch, it's worth three or you are only allowed to take two touches. So we can play with the task with regards to it, with regards to the team and all the individuals. We can play with the environment, primarily in our sport that will concern itself with the pitch, but equally the way in which you score the goal could be considered uh, an environmental constraint. So for instance, if we were working on a session around forward runs, we might actually have an end zone American football style where players can run into that space to receive the ball. Um, and you could perhaps constrain it that it has to be ball arrives first, then player arrives, 
um, which links to offside. So there's a, a constraint around how we might score. I might then get more forward runs in my session, which supports the player with forward runs as opposed to having a traditional goal and a goalkeeper in. But equally, I can split the pitch in thirds horizontally or split the pitch in thirds vertically. Fat pitch, thin pitch, big pitch, small pitch. We can really play with the environment. And then I guess individual constraints. I can reward a player's role in the practice. Um, I can link two or more players together and play them against each other. Oh, I could restrict a player's role in the practice. You're only allowed two touches. You can only play off one touch. You can only play off your weak foot, whatever. This slide isn't designed to be an exhaustive list. And this is where individual coaches' creativity really comes in. Um, and the individual coach really knowing their individual players comes in. And, and I guess there's a link here to practice design. One thing I would urge you to do is to consider contextualizing constraints when we when we begin to use them with our players. And there's three examples here of constraints that I've used with athletes in my environment at Fulham Football Club, working with young players, working with under 10s and younger. So I've used constraints such as this um, to support player development but this, I found that they're really motivational for young athletes clearly if I did this with the under 23s it wouldn't go down in the exact same way but with the younger players in the foundation phase it, it's a fantastic way of contextualizing it with other players in other age groups and other experience levels you might need to seek to do things in a slightly different way when it comes to considering constraints we need to go back a step and actually consider our practice design. So we often use uh, uh, at Fulham and it's fairly influenced by our head of academy coaching. We can consider like four P's, which is a nice acronym for remembering how to perhaps plan a practice. So we might start with the type of pitch. Um, and I suppose actually we'd start with the type of thing we want to support the players with. So it might be, let's say, crossing and finishing, because I've used that example a few times. Well, I might then have, in terms of my pitch type, I might take a normal pitch and I might just bring it in a little bit narrower, pull the goals together slightly so that I've actually got a wider pitch than normal, which will give us more opportunities to get the ball out wide. I might then distribute the players in a certain way to give me more wide players. I might have a fullback and a winger so that I've got more players in the wide areas. I might use pitch markings to support me, so I might cone off some thirds so I've got a middle channel and I've got two wide areas Then I can use those as reference points. And I can then constrain players. I can say, if you score from a wide area by crossing the ball in into the middle area and your teammate scores, that's worth three. But if you score in a normal way by, let's say, robbing the opposition and then, and then belting it in the top corner, that could be worth one. So you can still do that. But I'm encouraging the players to actually get better at crossing and finishing just by the constraints I've placed on the practice. And I get to the constraints by considering how I design the practice. So using the four P's, and again, this isn't a exhaustive way of doing it, but using the four P's as a way of designing the practice might help me support the players with their development. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this slide here just to, with regards to some, some constraints. So let, let me just talk through it. I've got on the left-hand side of the column some different topics that we might want to support the players with. Um, and I guess traditional like coaching session topics. I've then got the parameter that I might play with. So this is my environmental constraint on the next column. And then again, and I, I won't take credit for this, I will point to our head of academy coaching at Fulham Football Club, Ben Bartlett, who's come up with a restrict, relate and reward model. Again, loves an acronym, three R's. Um, in terms of different ways, just to illustrate how you might constrain a practice. So let's talk through a, an example. I need to help my players get better at managing the momentum of the game. They might be under 18s or something. To do that, I'm going to give them a big pitch so that the game has some momentum. And then I'm going to restrict them, perhaps. So it must, you know, it must win tournament. Three points for a win, nothing for a draw, nothing for a defeat. I've placed some constraints on the practice that just enhance things a little bit. Um, I can then relate players from one constraint to another and relate them from one environment to another. So I could play a, a double header where the score from game one is flipped for game two. So if you win game one, two nil, in the next game, you're two nil down. So I get to play with momentum for my players and teach them how to build it and teach them how to maybe slow it. Um, and then I can reward them where the number of passes equals the number of goals. And again, that supports my players with managing the momentum. There's some additional examples here. I'm just going to talk through 
one more, which are, if I take the next one, playing forward. So I'm going to help my players with playing forward. I'm going to split the pitch in thirds horizontally. So I'll have a middle third and then two end thirds, which will include the penalty boxes. And I'll restrict the practice, or I could restrict the practice by saying all forward passes into the next third must be off one touch. I can relate things by saying try to inject speed into your attack or have you watched this player do this? And I can reward the activity by saying the number of one touch passes used in the attack will equal the number of goals. So a model here of restrict, relate and reward where we can use this to constrain practices to support the players. I must illustrate at this point that we're not when we talk about utilising constraints, often less is more. And often simplicity can be really, really key. So I'm conscious that on this slide and then in the previous slide back here, I've talked through a number of different constraints that come from task, environment, individual and the three R's on this one in regards to restrict, relate and reward. What I don't want to get across to you all is that you need to use loads of constraints in order for your practice to be um, any good. Actually, the best practices that I've delivered and the best practices I've seen as a coach developer are often ones that might only have one or two constraints on them. Therefore, they become very, very clear to the athletes and the, and the athletes get, get some time to have a go at it. There's some academic research around how players learn that suggests that, and it's not rocket science, suggests that athletes need time in their activity to learn. They need time to adapt and they need time to adjust to the activity. So it is by no means a sense of having more constraints is, is a good thing. Sometimes it's just having one or two. I've certainly done a session on purely just attacking wide. And I use that example again with crossing and finishing, where we simply just talk about goals from across are worth more. And I have the pitch split in thirds vertically. And that is as simple as the session gets. And I go in and coach from there. I've reached the end pretty, pretty swiftly. Um, I know we spoke about presenting for sort of 30 to 60 minutes. I've presented for about 30, so it's not, not too bad. Um, I'm also conscious that people have got have got day jobs and I've been on many of these webinars where some of these presentations have lasted for hours and hours. So hopefully me being quite succinct has been helpful. Um, I know that there's a, a time now within this to, to go through any questions and have a bit of a Q&A. So if I just stop sharing um, and then I'll shut up for a minute and see 